Hi class, this is your instructor, Scholar Huff, and we're now in the 30, 30, 32nd chapter, excuse me, chapter 32, which is Econoderms and Chordates, the Deuterostomes. So here we are, and the question begs, what does a sea star have in common with a fish, frog, hawk, or even a human? You may think it's strange to group the echinoderms, which includes the starfishes or sea stars, sea urchins, and sand dollars with chordates. So the clade, or in this way it says phylum, that includes humans and other animals with vertebral columns. However, even though these animals look and behave differently from one another, fossil evidence and of course, morphological and developmental, and even the molecular data, suggests that chordates and echinoderms share a common ancestor and are closely related. In chapter 31, we discussed two major protostome branches of the animal kingdom. So with those two branches, we'll now focus on a third major branch of the animal kingdom, the deuterostomes. Some biologists speculate that the last common ancestor of the Deuterostomes was an animal that obtained food by filtering ocean water. The two major groups or phyla of living animals assigned to Deuterostomes are the Echinoderms, which includes sea stars and sea urchins, and the Chordates. The largest Chordate group is Vertebrata, or subphylum, which includes the animals with which we are most familiar, such as those fishes, amphibians, reptiles, which of course includes birds, and mammals. The Galapagos marine iguana is a reptile and a member of the vertebrate clade that has many interesting adaptations. So if you look in your textbook on page 600, 676, you will see the Galapagos marine iguana. So as we begin this chapter, there will be a brief introduction and to the deuterostomes and a survey of the echinoderms. And then we'll go directly into the chordates and describe those key chordate characteristics. So I mentioned that marine lizard, the only marine lizard being that Galapagos marine iguana. Well, this iguana class, it lives on land and feeds along the shore and in the ocean. Hence, it is adapted to ingesting salt in its diet of red and green algae. So it shoots out salty water through its nostrils and of course, it can be seen that encrusted salt as a white cap, as we discuss, on its head. So, let's get right into what a deuterostome is. So, let's begin now. So, looking closely here, I have pictures showing, of course, one deuterostome. And now, deuterostomes class in the clade deuterostomia make up the third major branch of the animal kingdom. And the deuterostomes include echinoderms, which of course are the sea stars, sea urchins and sand dollars, and the chordates. And that's the phylum that includes humans and other vertebrates. So biologists classify the hemochordates, meaning a small group of worm-like marine animals, as deuterostomes. And the hemochordates from Hemochordata have a three-part body plan made up of a probos proboscis, collar, and trunk. So these animals have the characteristic ring of cilia around the mouth, and the most familiar hemochordates are the acorn worms, an animal that lives buried in mud or sand. So with this, the deuterostomes evolved from a common ancestor during the Proteozoic Eon more than 550 million years ago, and the major groups were present during the early Cambrian period and were characterized by several shared derived characters. And we'll get to those here shortly, meaning those synapomorphies or synapomorphic characters. So those evolutionary novelties are present in most recent common ancestor, in their most recent common ancestor. So evidence for the relatedness of chordates, the hemochordates, and echinoderms come from the molecular data and patterns of embryonic development. For example, deuterostomes are characterized by radial rather than spiral cleavage. Their cleavage is indeterminate, which means that, the, the, of course, the fate of their cells is fixed later in the development, so that this is that reason why you can take a cell from an embryo, freeze an embryo, and of course, conduct those genetic tests, such as the PGD, the pregenetic diagnosis. 
So in deuterostomes, the mouth does not de develop from the blastopore. In other words, the anus develops first, that, blastopore, that first blastopore opening. And the blastopore of deuterostomes becomes anus, which of course is located near the future side of the anus. And the mouth part develops from a second omium on the anterior end of that, in of that embryo, thus the name deuterostome, which is derived for the word second mouth. So, of course, hereafter we'll get to further characteristics, but right now, let's get directly to where we've left off. So, here we're at the echinoderms and chordates. So, if you have your chart, the chart we began last chapter, which by and large is complete other than including the echinodermata and chordata. So, let's get now into echinodermata. So, examples of which I've mentioned a number of these already. But the sea urchin class, the sea star or starfish, and of course includes other things such as the sand dollar and even the sea cucumber. So the symmetry class is different. The larvae have bilateral symmetry as opposed to the adult with pentamental symmetry. They are triploblastic eucylomates with a, of course, coelom that is completely lined. The skeleton is an endoskeleton. They have a highly derived body plan because, of course, as animals are, there is no shared body plan, and they have a complete digestive tract. There is a complete digestive tract there. Complete. And they they live class in the marine environment. These are the core the echinoderms, excuse me. Moving on. So this shows class two examples. There are sea urchins, and of course, a sea star. Yet another sea star. And let's move it on to, of course, the last group. So this is phylum chordata, including things such as the lancelet, the frog, and of course, even homo sapiens, meaning humans, and a number of other things, which we'll get to later. Exhibiting bilateral symmetry, we are triploblastic eucylomates with an endoskeleton, as we just saw with the echinoderms. And of course, we have a complete digestive system with two openings, a mouth and an anus. And we live class all over the world, meaning from the marine environment to freshwater and even in the terrestrial environment. Let us continue now on to a couple of pictures. <coughs> so to the top left is the lancelet, and the bottom is another picture class of the lancelet. And of course, top right class is an amphibian. Now let's get us let's get to Kingdom Animalia a bit more specifically here. Let us start it. So now, Kingdom Animalia by way of phylum Echinodermata. So the Echinoderms class, as they are, they have one of the most derived body plans of the animal kingdom. Highly derived they are. So with this, just keep in mind that there is an estimated 7,000 species. And of course, with that, there is an estimated more than 13,000 extinct species of echinoderm. So with that, they have that most highly derived body plan of the animal kingdom, well, their symmetry class, as I just mentioned, is quite different, meaning being different class from that that is, of course, in the larva compared to the adult. Additionally, they have spiny skins. They have a water vascular system and tube feet. So they are some of the most unique animals you'll, you'll learn about in the course. So with that, the larva, which are bilaterally symmetrical, they, have, they are ciliated and free-swimming, and then thereafter, as adult, they exhibit that pentaradial symmetry, in which, of course, the body is arranged into the typical five parts around that center ax axis. So biologists have hypothesized that early echinoderms were sessile and that radial symmetry evolved as an adaptation to their lifestyle. So that radial symmetry allows these animals to respond effectively in every direction surrounding their environment. In the meantime, they have the endoskeleton class consisting of those calcareous plates that, of course, bear spines, as you see it there. I'm going to keep on moving, but just keep in mind that the radial symmetry allows them to be some pretty in intense predators that, of course, live mostly at the bottom of the ocean. 
looking closely here, this is what you would see, of course, upon dissection. So when we do dissect the adult sea star, everything you're seeing here, you shall see. One thing that may or may not be their class is the presence of gonads, and it just depends upon the age of our sea stars. The left top, top left is the sea urchin class, the, the right hand side here. That would be a sand dollar. Bottom class, more sea urchins. And then, of course, this is a cross section of one of those arms or rays. It's amazing to see, and of course, by way of dissection, you see the very same. So as mentioned earlier class, echinoderms exhibit that water vascular system with that fluid filled canal and chambers. So water enters into the echinoderm, enters into, enters into the sea star by way of its madreporite. And this is spelled incorrectly, it should be the madreporite. I apologize for the typo there. So via dissection, of course, as you use your probe, you will be able to feel just how hard that madreporite is. So branches of the water vascular system then lead to their, of course, it says numerous two feet. And with that well-developed coelom, they have no excretory organs. In the very same way, they have a simple nervous system by way of that nerve ring. They have a nerve ring. So with that, the nerve ring has the nerves which extend out from it. And just keep in mind that they also have no brain. So the egg and sperm are released into the water for fertilization. Up next, we have phylum chordata. So the chordates begin here, class, on page 681. And let us get right to it. So the chordates, as they are, have been further divided into three different subphyla, or three different groups. They are as follows. So we have those known as the urochordates, or urochordata, and these include the tunicates, the sea tunicates. They are. Thereafter, there are the cephalochordates from cephalochordata, and then, of course, the vertebrates from vertebrata, and these are the animals with backbones. So do get in your brains now that just because someone says, oh, that's a chordate, it does not mean that, of course, there's a backbone. It's only class. Those animals that are members of vertebrata, the vertebrates. So biologists currently assign the chordates, phylum chordata, to three clades or subphyla, as I just mentioned. So those cephalochordates include the lancelets. Urochordates include the C tunicates. And, of course, you all know the vertebrates well. So, although the structures of living species may suggest otherwise, the molecular data support that the urochordates, not cephalochordates, are the sister group to the vertebrates, which I find utterly amazing. So, the chordates, of course, are deuterostomes, and they are silomates with bilateral symmetry, that tube within a tube, that completely line body cavity, with those three well-developed germ layers, the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. So with that, just keep in mind that there are four shared drive characters that distinguish chordates from all other groups of animals. So these characters, which evolved in connection with the evolving methods of locomotion and attaining food, and are the notochord, the hollow dorsal tubular nerve cord, the post tail. And, of course, the endostyle or thyroid gland. And you may hear me refer to those classes being those pharyngeal gill slits. Let us now begin. And as I get to these, just, just keep in mind, as we see here, the urochordates, the cephalochordates, the cephalochordates with the lancelet. And, of course, now what we're getting to, on your exam class, you'll be tasked with briefly describing these four characteristics of chordates that I'm getting to now. Let us begin. So all chordates, as it states have these. So just keep in mind on your lecture test, I say again, please bear in mind that on your lecture test, being of course what is called test three, you all will be tasked with describing these. So I can't stress enough. Please take amazing notes. Let us begin. So all chordates have that notochord. And it's that during some time in their life cycle that it's there. So 
the notal chord class, as I've described that hollow, excuse me, as I've described that notal chord, it's that dorsal longitudinal rod composed of spongy con connective tissue. And of course, it's surrounded by a tough fibrous sheath. So the notal chord is firm, al although it is firm and flexible, and it provides support. So it plays an important role in way of embryonic development. So this supportive, stiffening cartilaginous rod with that gel-like pulpus is then, of course, going to be replaced by the spine. Secondly, at some point in the life cycle, the chordates all have that dorsal tubular nerve cord. So the chordate nerve cord differs from the nerve cord of most other animals in that it is located dorsally rather than ventrally, and it's hollow and not solid. And then, of course, it's single and not at all double. So just keep in mind that this nerve cord, of course, is going to be, of course, the spinal cord that attached is to what will eventually enlarge to form the brain superiorly. And this is what makes up the eventual class central nervous system. The third portion is that chordates have a larva or embryo with a muscular post anal tail. And yes, this is that appendage that extends posteriorly to the anus, hence the name post anal tail. So as I, as I mentioned this, just keep in mind that it's just that extension of that nodal cord. And of course, it goes past the anus. And lastly, we're at the endostyle. And you may hear that endostyle class being referred to as pharyngeal gill slits. You may hear it being referred to as pharyngeal gill slits. Let us begin. So the endostyle is a groove and it's on the floor of the pharynx that secretes mucus that traps food particles in the seawater passing through the pharynx. So the endostyle is present in urochordates and cephalochordates and even lamprey larvae. So it's that thyroid gland, the thyroid gland that evolved from the endostyle and it is present in all of the chordates. So it's these pharyngeal gill slits that are another important characteristic of chordates in that during embryonic development, it's a series of grooves that develop in the body wall in the region of the pharynx. I Meaning that's part of the digestive tract that's posterior to the mouth. And you may hear someone saying you have a larynx and a pharynx. So the pharynx, of course, has, I guess you would say, passage for both, I guess you call it oxygen, as well as foodstuffs and even water, things you drink. However, it's that larynx class that is that passage only for gases. So of course, only oxygen would be going into your larynx. And then, of course, into the bronchial tree thereafter. So what I'm getting to is that in some chordates class, it's the endostyle or pharyngeal gill slits <clears throat> that filter the food particles from the water, and in others of which it becomes the gills, and to exchange gases. And then thirdly, the gill slits may only be present embryonically. So now that we've done those, let's get to a photo that shows these. So we have that dorsal tubular hollow nerve cord. We have the noto cord. We have the pharyngeal gill slits, of course, by way of the endostyle. And then lastly is the muscular post anal hill. So now, class, let's get into those six classes of chordates. The six classes of chordates. And as we do these, just take your time. There is a lot here. But of course, you all can definitely do it. So the first class will be class chondroichthys, the cartilaginous fishes, those sharks, skates, and rays, as they are sometimes said. So these are jawed marine and freshwater fishes with a skeleton of cartilage. So vertebrae are present, as well as gills. There are placoid scales and two pairs of fins, and these are oviparous and oviparous, ovoviparous, excuse me, or viviparous, meaning, and then they have well-developed sense organs, well-developed sense organs. So keeping in mind that the chondrichthys, they, of course, appear to be successful marine forms during the Devonian period. And with this, most species are ocean dwellers, and there are a few of those that are in fresh water. 
So with the exception of whales, the sharks are the largest living vertebrates. And, and some whale sharks can, of course, get as long as 49 feet, which I say is pretty long. So in most rays, excuse me, most rays and skates, hence I say sharks, skates, and rays, are flattened creatures that live partly buried in the sand. So chondroitheids retain their cartilaginous embryonic skeleton, although this skeleton is not replaced by bone. In many species, calcium salts are added to the cartilage for strength. So all, all chondroitheids class have jaws and two pairs of fins, and the skin, of course, contain placoid scales, which are tooth-like structures, and then the lining of the mouth contains larger but essentially smaller scales that serve as teeth. And then the teeth of other vertebrates are homologous with these scales. So shark teeth are embedded in the flesh and not attached to jaw bones. So new teeth develop continuously in rows behind the functional teeth that migrate forward and replace those that are lost. Hence, you of course may have found a shark tooth before. So with this, I'll get on to our next class, class Osteichthys. So class Osteichthys includes the bony fish. So keeping in mind the, the bony fish, I'd like to think of these as being, of course, things such as, as I have it there, bass and brim, perch, of course, salmon, tuna, and even trout. And sometimes they call these ray-finned fishes. So they're bony marine and freshwater fishes with gills and a swim bladder with gills and a swim bladder and thinking of these fishes as i get to further notes here the bony fishes appeared earlier in the fossil record than the cartilaginous fishes both groups have evolved and they evolved about the same time so most bony fishes are characterized by a bony skeleton with many vertebrae and bone has an advantage over cartilage because it provides excellent support and effectively stores calcium. Most species have a flexible median and paired fins supported by long rays made by cartilage or bone. So they have overlapping bony dermal scales that cover the body and a lateral bony flap. Oh, and with that, you have the operculum that extends posteriorly from the head that protects their gills. So most bony fishes are oviparous and most species lay an impressive number of eggs and fertilize them externally. So the ocean sunfish lays more than 300 million eggs, you all. And of course, most of those eggs and young become food for other animals. So the probability of surviving is increased certain by certain behavior adaptations. For example, many species of fishes build nests for their eggs to protect them, and other species have internal fertilization and give birth to live young. All right, next up class is class amphibia, including class things such as salamanders, frogs, and toads. So these, of course, have aquatic larvae, which typically undergo metamorphosis into terrestrial adults. Gas exchange occurs through lungs and or their, mo their moist skin. So in these class, being class amphibia, they have two atria and a single ventricle. So I'll say again, they have two atria and a single ventricle. And then they have systemic and pulmonary circulation. So getting to the amphibians, of course, biologists classify the modern amphibians into three clades. The caudata with a tail, the caudata with a tail, and gymnophiona, of course, the limbless, the limbless ones, and the anura, and the anura have no tail. So caudata includes the salamanders, the mud puppies, and the newts, all animals with long tails. The anura, which have no tail, includes the frogs and toads, most with legs adapted for hopping. And the gym, gymphoina, I'm sorry, <laughs> the gymnophiona, includes the limbless caseons. So although some adult amphibians are quite successful as land animals and live in dry environments, most return to the water to reproduce. So eggs and sperm are typically released in the water. As an earlier mentioned class, 
many amphibians undergo metamorphosis, which is that transition from larva to adult. So the embryos of frogs and toads develop into larvae called tadpoles, which I'm thinking that you all have seen before. So it's these larvae that have tails and gills and most feed on aquatic plants. After time, the tadpole undergoes metamorphosis, which is regulated by hormones secreted by the thyroid gland. During this process of metamorphosis, gills and gill slits disappear, the tail is re resorbed, and the legs emerge. The digestive tract shortens, and food preference shifts from plant material to a carnivorous diet. So the mouth widens, a tongue develops, and the tympanic membrane and eyelids appear. Keep in mind the tympanic membrane class referring to the eardrum. And then the eye lens shape changes, and there are many biochemical changes that accompany the transmission from completely aquatic life to a semi-terrestrial one. Several tadpoles, I'm sorry, excuse me, <laughs> several salamanders, such as the mud puppy, do not undergo complete metamorphosis and retain many larval characteristics, even when sexually mature as adults. The coloration of amphibians may conceal them in their habitat, or may be very bright and striking. And keep in mind that many of the brightly colored species are poisonous. So it's their distinctive colors that warn predators that they are not encountering an ordinary amphibian. And some frogs camouflage themselves by changing colors. So adult amphibians do not depend solely on the primitive lungs for the exchange of respiratory gases. Their moist glandular skin, which lacks scales, is plentiful, plentifully supplied with blood vessels, which also serves as a respiratory surface. So the numerous mucous glands within the skin help keep the body surface moist, which is important for gas exchange, and the mucus also makes the animal slippery, facilitating its escape from predators. And most amphibians have glands on their skin that secrete a toxic or foul-tasting substance that repels predators. So as I earlier mentioned class, the amphibian heart contains two atria, receiving blood, and a single ventricle, pumping blood into the arteries. So a double circuit of blood vessel keeps oxygen-rich blood and oxygen-poor blood partially separate. So they have both systemic circulation, blood passes through, and then thereafter, returning to the heart, it goes directed through the pulmonary circulation to the lungs and skin, where it is recharged with oxygen. So the oxygen-rich blood returns to the heart and is pumped throughout the systemic circulation again. Keep this in mind. So up next class, we have reptilia including the turtles, the lizards, the snakes, and please, the class, do not forget about crocodilians and birds. So the first group class, turtles, lizards, and snakes, are amniotes with horny scales adapted for reproduction on land with internal fertilization, the leathery shell, and the amnion. They have lungs, and of course, ventricles of the heart is partly divided. In crocodilians and birds, however, the amniotes with two complete ventricles, they care for their young, and of course, the birds have feathers. There are anterior limbs, modified as wings. They are combat, compact excuse me, endotherms with vocal calls and complex songs. So now on to the reptilians. So many reptilians were, of course, once taught that there were three main groups. In, in other words, biology instructors taught it as having three main groups or three classes of amniotes meaning the AVs, Animalia. However, cladistic analyses determined that class Reptilia was not a monophyletic group without birds because it included some but not all of the descendants and it was paraphyletic. So for this reason, this reason excuse me, biologists now classify birds as a group of reptiles. So with that being the case, reptiles have many terrestrial adaptations. So many reptilian characters are adaptations to that terrestrial life. So the female reptile secretes a leathery shell around the egg, which helps to prevent develop, the developing embryo from drying out. The shell pre presents a challenge for reproduction because the sperm cannot penetrate it. Fertilization must take place within the body of the female before the shell is added, and in this process the male uses a copulatory organ called the penis to transfer sperm into the female reproductive tract. An amnion surrounds the embryo as it develops within the protective shell. The hard, dry keratin scales that are part of the reptile's skin retard drying in yet another adaptation, adaptation class to life on land. The scaly protective armor, which also protects the reptile from predators, is shared periodically. The dry reptilian skin does not allow effective gas exchange. 
Hence, of course, the reptilian lungs are better developed than the sac-like lungs of amphibians. So they have divided into many chambers glass. The reptile lung provides an increased surface area for gas exchange. The hearts of the amniotes contain two atria. The ventricle of reptiles is either partially or completely divided. The division into right and left ventricles enhances the separation of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood. The most efficient circulatory and respiratory systems of reptile, reptiles are critical for animals with keratinized epidermis. Like fishes and amphibians, many reptiles lack metabolic mechanisms for regulating body temperature. They are ectotherms, meaning that their body temperature fluctuates with the temperature of the surrounding environment. So some reptiles have behavior adaptations that help them maintain the body temperature higher than that of the environment. For instance, you may have observed a lizard basking in the sun, which raises its body temperature and increasing its metabolic rate. This increased rate permits the lizard to hunt actively for food. When the body of a reptile is cold, its metabolic rate is low, and the animal tends to be sluggish. Ectothermia explains why lizards, snakes, and turtles are more successful in warm than in cold climates. Many reptiles are predators, and their paired limbs, usually with five toes, are well adapted to running and climbing in search of prey, in addition to their well-developed sense organs to enable them to, of course, locate prey. So the reptiles have two major lineages. So we have those which includes snakes, lizards, worms, and of course, lizard-like animals at burrow called tartaras. And the second lineage including, of course, the exant turtles, the terrapins, and tortoises. And the, of course, crocodilians, which of course include the crocodiles, the alligators. So of course, these animals along with the birds are the surviving reptiles of the archosaur lineage. So from here, class, we now get to aves, which I, of course, have just described, which are included with reptilia, and now to class mammalia. So in class mammalia, we have, of course, the monodremes, the marsupial mammals, and, of course, the well-developed placental mammals. So we have the protheria, the metatheria, and the eutheria. So the amniotes with hair, females nourish young with many mammary glands, there is differentiation of teeth. There are three middle ear bones, three middle ear bones, stapes, incus, and malleus, malleus, the diaphragm, which we must have, a heart with two separate atria and two separate ventricles. We are now class have endotherm, so they are endothermic with a highly developed nervous system. Let us now begin. So, since we are here with what we call the mammals class, with what we call the marsupial mammals, the monotremes and placental mammals, let us now begin. Mammals in class mammalia have many unique characters. Derived characters include mammary glands that produce milk for the young, hair for all mammals, meaning have at least a few hairs at some time in their life, and no other organism has true hair class. They have one pair of temporal openings in the skull, differentiated teeth, the incisors, the canines, premolars, and molars, lung with alveoli, completely divided ventricles, kidneys which help conserve water, and three middle ear bones. And other tetrapods have only a single bone, the stapes in the middle ear. So the evolution of the cochlea, the, the organ for hearing in the inner ear, gives mammals an excellent sense of hearing. So contributing significantly to the success of mammals, the nervous system is more highly developed than in any other group of animals. So the cerebrum is especially large and complex, and the outer gray region, the cerebral cortex, in mammals is highly specialized by way of that cerebral cortex, called the neocortex, and it has six layers of neurons. So the specific regions in the neocortex are specialized for functions such as vision, hearing, touch, movement, emotional response, and higher cognitive function. Fertilization in mammals is internal, with the exception of the monotremes that lay eggs. Mammals are viviparous, meaning most mammals develop a placenta, an organ of exchange between the developing embryo and the mother. As, mothers, as the mother's blood passes through the blood vessels in the placenta, 
It delivers nourishment and oxygen to the embryo and carries off wastes. By carrying their developed young internally, mammals avoid the hazards of having eggs consumed by predators. By nourishing the young and caring for them, the parents offer both protection and an education on how to obtain food and to avoid being eaten. A muscular diaphragm, a muscular diaphragm, excuse me, helps to move air into and out of the lungs. Like birds, mammals are endotherms, but mammals appear to have evolved many endothermy independently of birds. Some of the adaptations that allow mammals to obtain a constant body temperature include the covering of insulating hair, very efficient lungs with alveoli, those air sacs through which gas exchange with the blood takes place, a fully divided ventricle, complete separation of pulmonary and systemic circulations, red blood cells without nuclei serve as efficient oxygen transporters too. Lastly, the limbs of mammals are variously adapted for walking, running, climbing, swimming, burrowing, and fly, or flying, not and flying, but or flying. In most terrestrial mammals, the limbs are more directly under the body than in the extant reptiles, which contributes to speed and agility. So just keep in mind that monotremes lay eggs, and including animals such as the duck-billed platypus and the spiny anteaters. The marsupial, mammals, the marsupial mammals have a pouch, and that includes class animals such as the wombat, the kangaroo, and the opossum. And of course, the placental mammals have a placenta. So to end this chapter class, I've left you all here with this cladogram, or this phylogenetic tree. So this class shows where we've been with this chapter. On your tests, you should have the same. I mean, you'll be given this very figure, and what you will be tasked with doing class is adding these synapomorphies. You'll be tasked with adding these synapomorphies. And not just haphazardly, but in, of course, the correct order and place. So, by way of our Chordate Ancestor class, this shows all of the chordates, be it those with a backbone or those class without a backbone. And as you look closely, you have those four basic characteristics here, which, of course, led us to the chordates and chord that corded ancestor, whether, of course, there is a backbone by vertebrata, or, of course, those that are the urochordates from urochordata, or those cephalochordates. So, again, you'll be tasked with adding these synapomorphies class on your lecture exam. And if you have any further questions, please let me know. It should look just like that. So, this has been your instructor, Skowerhoff, and this was Chapter 32 class, the Deuterostomes. So please study well and prepare for your test because this test class will include just those two chapters, being the 31st and 32nd chapter. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, stop by the office class, or give me a telephone call. Thank you all for listening class and study very well.